before we begin, I'm just going to say if you're worried about being spoiled for Switchback and don't want to really be spoiled in any regard in terms of story or gameplay, I will be playing gameplay throughout this review that will spoil some enemy types, locations, and different parts of the game. But verbally, I'm not really going to spoil anything apart from a few enemies and game mechanics. So if you want to tab out and just listen to this review, go ahead and do so. With that being said, let's head straight into this. And thank you once again for Supermassive Games for allowing me to review this game and get my hands on it slightly early. So Switchback VR, I've just finished playing it in essentially what is one sitting, and I think that's where I start with this review, the fact that I played through Switchback in one sitting, because it gripped me in a way that Russia Blood did back when that came out. I wanted to play more, I kept playing more, and I played through all of Switchback's 10 levels, basically all the way through at once, and I enjoyed almost every second of it. There are a few caveats and issues that I have with the game, mostly technical stuff and we'll get into that, but overall my impressions are incredibly positive, and while I've seen a few other mixed reviews, I don't necessarily agree with what they're saying, and I have some differing opinions. So let's start off by explaining what Switchback VR even is. It's essentially an on-rails shooter set in the horror genre that's set in the dark pictures universe by Supermassive Games. The same studio that came out with The Quarry and Until Dawn, this is an extension of their Dark Pictures series of stories, and we'll get further into how they incorporate that in the story section of this review, but that is essentially the gist of it. In my opinion, it goes further than being just an on-rail shooter, but once again, I'll get into that further along. That is the general gist of the Dark Pictures Switchback VR, so let's head into my first section of talking points about it. Firstly, let's start with one of the most impressive things for me, and that is the level setting and the art direction. The art direction and the art team they did a stellar job with this game. Every level looks incredible, the detail is there, the scale is massive in some cases, and they handle that incredibly well. And speaking to some of the level designers, hearing about what compromises they made and tricks they used to make this whole thing work in terms of the huge scenes you're presented with, is just kind of nuts. No, that's nuts. God, the volumetric smoke and the lighting and everything, it's just, it's perfect, it really is. And that's that level done. That being said, the enclosed spaces are also where Switchback VR thrives, giving you that sense of claustrophobia, especially with the combination of different haptic techniques and taking away your aids like flashlights and your guns entirely provides for an incredible experience. Some standouts for me in this regard were Man of Medan, with the Orang Medan being a massive looming ship, seeing cranes, industrial areas, and seeing the mass of the ship, the different parts of the boat. They're absolutely huge. The scale of the ocean is seen here and it's massive. The forest from Little Hope also gave me the same impression. And overall, the scale wowed me so much that I didn't expect it to. I didn't expect the scale of the environments to be such a standout for essentially an on-rails horror shooter, but they were. Holy shit. I am speechless at that. Oh my god, okay. The amount of assets and breakable objects on screen is also kind of nuts. The destruction of different boxes and props and elements and the way they interact with each other and even some obstacles that you're faced with can be destroyed and they collapse in a really realistic way and that kind of stunned me. That is impressive. That many breakable things? That is impressive. Big fan of that. The amount of assets in one room, even when talking about enemies, especially with the first level set in The Devil in Me, there are some scenes here that are just massive in scale in terms of NPC count or in terms of prop count and hats off to the environmental artists and everyone that helped put that together and the level designer especially, absolutely insane. This part is very cool. Look how big this fucking room is, dude. Look how many, look how many assets there are. Keep that train left. Keep looking. Oh shit, they're on the ceiling. However, this does come with a few compromises, and although I can't confirm that this is the case, I have a feeling this amount of assets and breakable objects and different props leads to a lack of fidelity and a lower resolution than other flagship PSVR 2 titles like Horizon Call of the Mountain or Resident Evil 8. Things can look a little PSVR 1-ish 
is the only way I can put it in terms of shimmer on the edges and aliasing. But to be honest, the use of good shadows, negative space and darkness hides this a lot of the time and your brain kind of just gets used to it. I wasn't bouncing back and forth between different games at this point. I was playing Switchback on its own in one sitting, so I never had another game to actively compare it to. So I just got used to the visuals and to be honest, it didn't really bother me. But for some people, this might be a big turn off. The fact that the resolution isn't quite as high as you might expect it to be. Don't get me wrong, it's nothing like No Man's Sky seemingly weird and off port, but there are issues with resolution for people that really focus on that. I did have a few issues with popping. It was nothing massive, but it was there a couple of times. And I did have one instance of a breakable object not having textures on the breakable side. Like it was fine when it was unbroken, but when I broke it, the sides that were revealed on different parts of it as it fell apart, were just untextured. Um, I'm assuming that's a bug. That's the only bug I encountered of that type really. But it is worth noting that you might encounter things like that. Anyway, let's move on to the actual gameplay and the way it implements different aspects of the PSVR 2. Let's start with one of the most impressive features, the haptics and eye tracking. Let's start with the haptics first. And let's start with the controllers in that regard. The haptic stage triggers are great. Each gun feels different. When you move your hands, the guns move around in your hands and you feel that in the haptics. And that's something that I've never really seen before with any other VR title. Not even Pavlov on the PSVR 2 has that feature. It felt weighty, it gave the guns a sense of presence, and I really like that. Similarly, you can feel the track underneath you as you, say, go up an incline. You'll feel that in the controllers, in the bottom parts of the controllers and the haptics, and you'll feel each part of the track as you move over it. As for the headset, this was used sparingly but when it was implemented, it was implemented really well. For example, there's a stage of the game where your head is being touched by hands and you can feel them brushing over you. That's a really nice effect, but there were some other stages of the game, namely on the Man and Medan level, where objects came crashing down and I would expect to feel some haptics in the headset go off there, like in Horizon when a Thunderjaw steps past you, but I only felt them in the controllers. I'm not sure if that was a bug, but I'm pretty sure on my preview session it was the same. There just is no head haptics there. Isn't a massive deal, just would have been nice to have, but the controller haptics more than make up for it, to be honest, and unless you're really thinking about it, you're not gonna notice. But yeah, overall, I'm massively impressed by the haptic implementation. It's incredible. It's some of the best I've ever seen for PSVR 2, and it's kind of put a new standard for me in terms of the haptic use. Now moving on to eye tracking, this is another standout. The first stage that you might encounter it is a room that says nicely and don't blink on the front of it. You've probably seen this in the marketing if you've paid attention to Switchback at all in the past couple of months or weeks. And this is pretty incredible. Every time you blink, the enemies move, get closer to you and eventually start attacking you if you blink too much. Witnessing this for the first time at the preview event was amazing and it was just as good playing it in the full game. I've seen some reviews stating that it's used once and never used again. This isn't true. There are multiple points later on in the game, depending on what path you choose, where you will run into scenarios where eye tracking is used to move enemies when you blink. Oh, you can't cheat yet. You can't cheat yet. Ah oh, it's, it's, it's don't look away either. Fucking hell, there are so many of them. I feel like these things are going to start moving and attacking me at some point. Oh, Jesus Lord. I knew it! I knew it! I'm not blinking! Oh, I fucking blinked. I blinked. I blinked. Oh, fuck, it's in my way. I need to blink again. Fucking hell. This might just be my favorite feature of Switchback in terms of what influences the enemy design because it's truly terrifying. The game uses your own body and senses against you by using your natural reaction to blink against you. It's genius and it works amazingly. It'll get some amazing reactions out of people if you put them on it for the first time and send them off into the levels with these features implemented into them. Similarly to this, eye tracking is used in a different scenario where two or more enemies are put against you and if you look at them, they don't move, but if you look away, they start moving towards you. 
Switchback has a nice build up with this and this is consistent with all of its mechanics where it starts you small, gives you two enemies. If you look at one, the other moves towards you and if you look at the other, the one you were previously looking at starts moving towards you as well. It builds up slowly and eventually introduces more and more enemies with the same mechanics so your eyes are darting between them trying to pick and choose which enemies to shoot first and how to balance the situation you're presented with. Oh shit, okay, so they move when I'm not looking. I know, I, I'm familiar with your game. Oh shit, there's two here now. Oh fuck, there's three! Shit, 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 shit. This is another genius implementation of the tech, and whoever came up with this honestly just needs the biggest pay rise in existence. Amazing stuff. Right, let's move on to some more mechanics, past the ones that are implemented through the tech of the PSVR 2. Just like Rush of Blood, you've got dodging mechanics, obstacles will fall in front of you, you've got to lean left or right, and dodge out of the way. You also get different weapons like Rush of Blood, through the form of shooting crates that then transport weapons to you, and replace the ones in your hands. You can get shotguns, Uzis, there's a lot of different weapon variety, and you get some very cool ones towards the end that I won't spoil. But as I said before, each of them feel different, they're all useful in their own way. And the way you use these weapons also varies. For example, in the Devil in Me levels, there is an implementation of Dumet's traps around the hotel. Originally starting with traps forced against the player, but then the player can actually use them later on against enemies. Oh, I can stun him. Oh, wait. Oh! Oh my god! Oh my god, uh, that's fucking horrible. Nevertheless, that is such an amazing implementation and you use your weapons to trigger those traps. And it's just a really clever way of getting the player to defend themselves outside shooting enemies dead in the face. And of course, it wouldn't be a Dark Pictures game or a Supermassive game if there weren't choices for you to make. You will encounter different characters throughout the story and you will have a choice of whether to save them, save yourself, or perhaps you do wanna save them and you just fail. Your actions have consequences, and these aren't just for little fan servicey moments, these do have repercussions for the final level of the game. So pick and choose who you save, and save as many people as you can would be my advice. These act as fun little mini games that actually have consequences later on, and kind of get your heart pumping because you really want to try and save these characters that you know from the dark pictures as they fall into the story that you're in. Oh shit, oh I'm gonna have to save him now. I understand the assignment, okay. I'm gonna kill this man. I am gonna kill this man. And these, and then that. Please. I did it! I did it, I saved him! Oh, it's him! Oh, I saved him. Speaking of story, let's talk about it, because it's not really what people are excited about when talking about Switchback, and I understand why. I mean, I'm not going to get into story details right now, it's probably best if you just go into it blind, but I found it fine. It was serviceable, it's nothing on the level of the other Dark Pictures stories because there simply isn't the time to develop it here like they do in those games, but it serves its purpose and you get little cutscene-esque parts in between levels that bring you back to the main story and back to reality that you're seeing footage of on screen now. And it does help carry the story forward and the story is understandable. It's simple enough and it serves its purpose. However, what I do really appreciate is that each of the Dark Pictures stories from season one of the Dark Pictures are brought into the game. They have two levels each, and then you get two other levels that are independent from the stories of the Dark Pictures in this game. So 10 levels total. But each level dedicated to the Dark Pictures isn't just a retelling of those same stories. Sure, you might have some recurring characters, locations, and scenarios, but this very much is your character story in this game. It would have been incredibly easy to just go the basic route and retell the same narratives in a shorter format and just be lazy about it, to be honest. Throw these locations at the player, make them go, oh, I know this, and retell the same stories without having to come up with anything new. But game director Alejandro and the rest of the team have really come up with a way to intertwine the stories of the dark pictures with the new one that they've created. You can tell they love those stories, but they also wanna give their own story room to breathe and they transform the locations appropriately to convey this. 
but you will definitely get more out of this experience if you've played the dark pictures or at least maybe have watched a playthrough or are familiar with it before you jump into switchback it very much is a dark pictures tale and you'll get so much more out of the story locations and characters if you've played those games oh and the oh, and the punch bag i've just played through man of Medan recently so seeing all this is really cool. and now we go into the uh the tent and I'm about to be jump scared, aren't I? Maybe not. Oh, fucking hell, yes I am. Okay, now let's talk about another element, kind of of the story, but also of gameplay that I'm a massive fan of, and actually makes it so that you have to play the game more than once to get the full experience, and that is the branching paths. The switches in Switchback that you shoot at to change tracks allow you to go left or right and open up different possibilities for gameplay. It's almost guaranteed that if you and a friend play through this game, you're going to have completely different experiences on one level or another. Because once you choose a track, you're locked to it, and you've now gone that way and completely avoided the opposite track, which has a completely different experience on it. For example, the Don't Blink segment I mentioned earlier has a completely different track that leads to a different experience if you go the other way. This is a pretty genius way to encourage repeat playthroughs and adds a lot more replayability to the game. The team could have definitely just added all of these experiences onto one set track, but I feel like the level length is just right where it is now and I'm glad that you get the choice of which route you want to take and which experience you want to have instead of them just extending the levels to include everything at once. That sounds a little weird when I say it out loud because surely longer level length is a better thing, but trust me, giving the player the initiative to choose which way they want to go also adds a lot of fun to the experience of not knowing really where you're going to end up. And if you put a family member or a friend into this experience, they could have a completely different one to the one that you might have had through your playthrough. So, we'll go right. I've gone left on all the other ones, so. We shall stick with the right, I think. And finally, let's talk about the spooks. And this also kind of links back to the enemy variety that I talked about earlier. Most of the time, you'll have humanoid entities attacking you like zombies or Mr. Dumet's dull people. But occasionally, there'll be some variation of different enemies that I won't spoil. They're nothing too drastic. But to be honest, I'm not really that disappointed in the variety presented here. Everything works, everything's fine, everything spooks you. And I think the scares are very good. There is an over-reliance on jump scares, but to be honest, they're built up too well, and most of the time they're not telegraphed too much, so they do genuinely get you. That's not to say that that's the only type of scare this game will provide you with, because there is adequate use of lighting, sound, and game cues to get you properly spooked. Come on, I'm waiting. Oh fucking hell! Yes, I knew it. 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 No, 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 no! It's the place where I'm not looking. Holy shit! Holy shit! This is really dark. Oh, that's the ship. That's the Orang Madan. Dark. A byproduct of the tech and headset being used here is that when your flashlights go out or you're in a dark room, it is incredibly dark, as in pitch black. Those pixels pretty much switch off, and you're in the dark. This then enhances your auditory experience as you hit enemies running all around you or different audio cues going off and it ends up with a really immersive and scary experience. Oh shit, this is really dark. This is like some Resident Evil 7 stuff. Fuck, there's so many angles to be fucking jump scared from. On the opposite end of this as well, when scenes get bright, same with flames or car headlights, it really does blind you. It takes your eyes a little while to adjust, and that's something that I haven't really seen in any other headset, or implemented quite as well as it is in this game. Oh shit, that's really bright. Ah! But yeah, overall, I'm happy with the scares, the amount of them, and the quality of them. They genuinely got me quite a lot of times. So those are my thoughts on the Dark Pictures Switchback VR. Once again, thank you for Supermassive for giving me the opportunity to play and review this game. 
Those guys have genuinely been some of the nicest people I've ever had the pleasure of working with, and they've created a great product here. Switchback VR is not just a technical marvel, but it's also a testament to how well Supermassive does horror. And if you're a fan of VR horror, Switchback is an essential must-buy experience on PSVR 2. It's a spiritual successor to Until Dawn Rush of Blood in every possible way, and supersedes it in quite a lot of areas. While it might not have the same level of charm that Rush of Blood has, I'm gonna partially chalk that down to nostalgia for that series and that game. In a couple of years time, I'll probably feel the same way about Switchback as I do with Rush of Blood. And despite some of its technical issues, it's an experience that I'm very glad that I've had. It's an experience that I'll be showing a lot of other people when they come and try out the headset. And it's an experience that I'd recommend to you if you're interested in buying the game. Because although the main story took me about three hours and 50 minutes, it can easily be double that when you replay the game and choose the paths that you didn't choose the time before. This is aided by the fact that you can also check out the maps of the runs you've just taken that show you the choices that you made. Oh, it gives you a track layout of where you went. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, Switchback VR impressed me a hell of a lot and I'd recommend it to any horror fan. If you've played it already, although it just came out today, so if you have, Jesus Christ, you've done that quickly, although I guess I did as well, let me know what you think about it. Has this review influenced you at all? Please let me know down in the comments below. Even if it hasn't, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, feel free to leave a like and subscribe for a lot more VR content, PSVR 2 content and Battlefield content going forward. Once again, thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Give me around this corner.